there were 4,792 people who were homeless in Orange County, California in 2017. Many of these people have been living in encampments, particularly along the Santa Ana Riverbed. However, recently, the Santa Ana Riverbed encampment was cleared out, and people living there were given 30-day vouchers to stay in motels. Those 30 days are now up for many of these people, and the county has yet to find a permanent solution. There has been talk of erecting temporary encampments, but many citizens from these new cities have pushed back. At the center of this issue is federal judge David Carter. He called city leaders together for another meeting on April 3rd, 2018. I went to the courthouse on this day and spoke with several people who are either currently or formerly homeless. Here are some of the stories that these people had to share along with their insider information on what types of support are most helpful and needed in this situation. You could just introduce yourself. My name is Michael Bill. Everybody on the riverbed knows me as MJ. This uh -huh. is my trusty companion, Osiris. He's really cute. He's so, an old man. He's 16 now. <laughs> so you were saying that you were on the riverbed, and yes. how did you end up there? On July 31st, 2009, I had a home intruder while I lived in Tustin mm -hmm. break into my home and shot me in the head with a 44 Magnum. Jeez. I, I still have the bullet lodged in my head. I suffered. Wait, it's still in your head? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's, it's my joke, you know. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> what happened since then? You were they gave me, they gave the person that shot me three hots and a cot with the library that comes and visits him in prison for the next 17 years, where mm -hmm. I got the riverbed. So there was no support for you? Are no. you on disability? Do you get any I have social been security? I for my social security and I keep getting denied. What was your life like before you had the home intruder? I was a professional commercial diver. Mm -hmm. Did level two NDT welding mm -hmm. inspections. Mm -hmm. On bridges, on boats, dams, mm -hmm. I've been in the bottom of power plants, I've been from coast to coast. You said you went to side. college too. I went to the College of Oceaneering in Wilmington, California at the time mm -hmm. to become a hard hat deep sea diver. That's really cool. Well, MJ, once you left the riverbed, were you given one of the vouchers to go to the motels? Yes, I was given a 30 day voucher to the uh -huh. motel. But now that's I was up. there 28 days, and I was met with city net people with two deputy dogs standing one on each side of her, telling me I had to be out of the motel. Mm -hmm. They told me they were going to be back to pick me up and take me to a shelter. That I was told them I would more than happy to go check out the shelter. My concerns was my animal. Mm -hmm. He is my service animal. He detects my seizures. So he is, uh, for sure, a service animal. He's been registered or whatever the process he, is. He, he takes, he announces to everybody that you know, I'm having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And So MJ, what's your plan now? Okay. Anything else? I'm taking it as it goes right Thanks. now. I'm, I'm open to all kinds of suggestions. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to be able to go back to work, but I know I'm a workless comp case waiting to happen for any employer. Mm -hmm. So what brought you to the courthouse today? The fact or this is just the area that you're in right now? It's one, the area that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Two, I've, you're so cute with it. I've got a lot that needs to be said and heard. And it's just fortunate that I got to meet you. Yeah. For another, another avenue for my story to get out. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to share it. It's really great to meet all of you guys. I'm not Hello, sir. Can you tell us your name? Yeah, uh, Roger. Roger. I started working at 11 years of age. At ele age 11, you yeah, started yeah, working? Yeah. I was born dyslexic. Mm -hmm. So, I got passed through school. I worked all the time. But my first legal yeah. job at 18, I started doing custom bands in 1978. Over there, um, I was running five departments. I was making 20000 a year, guaranteed. Part of it was cash. That was mm -hmm. more my mother and my stepdad both made together, actually. Mm -hmm. And then some guy comes along on my mom and hits me on my motorcycle. Three, three, three years I had a motorcycle accident. If you ask me which way it was up, I couldn't tell you. I was at my, my went back to my mom's place for a little short period of time. She couldn't deal with it. But, um, so I, I ended up living in an oil pill for about six months in the Carmagee of all things. 
Um, <laughs> so, so wait a second. You you were in this accident, and then you ended up living in the fields. W- weren't there any services that could help um, with that or anything? Or? I should, uh, I should stay at the hospital, but... Roger explains that he was in such bad shape following the accident that he went and stayed in a field by his home instead of returning to the hospital. This was his first experience being homeless. He eventually returned to the hospital when something else happened. I went to go get the, uh... thing that walk away, the arc, the mm-hmm. I, passed, I blacked out 14 times on the way there and back. Wow. And, and then, uh... Yeah, I just fell over, picked myself up off the ground. Wow. So, so back to my doctor, they're trying to figure out what's going on. They had some more, more, uh, CAT scan and stuff done. Uh, they couldn't determine it. Mm-hmm. Over the next, well, 20 some years, I, the blackouts increased. Uh, I started going to where I could feel it coming on, and I just braced myself on walls. So all the time, I was bracing myself on a wall, and I go through this mm-hmm. thing. And then I went into seizures, and this all carried on for years. Roger's condition eventually improved, and he was able to return to work for the next 20 or so years. However, he had to work in labor due to the injury he sustained, and also due to literacy issues related to his dyslexia. Eventually, he sustained further injuries related to his work in labor, um, and he became homeless again. He was not able to seek support and fill out the appropriate applications, etc., um, due to his literacy issues. My question is, haven't you been receiving any form of assistance? You know, why any subsidized housing? You know, why Why have... Yeah, you had saved $3,000. You had to wait 19 months, it cut off, to see if you... To see if you qualify for Social Security and go before a judge. For 19 months, you were just kind of left hanging. Well, actually, the last four years, I'm left hanging. You are Sandy. Okay, and what's your story? From where I lived in Doria Apartments in Irvine. Wrapped around my throat. I had memory loss. So, that was on the riverbed. What are your plans now? Is your voucher up? I have to have uh, housing or somebody to approve the copies of my money order and my letter from Salvation Army. So you were in medical field for 26 years, but because of the injuries that you've sustained, you can't... Uh-huh. So you're on disability. Yeah, and then when he attacked me, he had a football background with yours. How do how does it um, make sense that someone who can't work is on disability, but the wage isn't enough? Yeah, but, yeah, that's what I mean. How can how can they possibly think that it's a living wage? Because um, wage is not really the proper term to use here, but you get the idea. I raised my daughter, you know, my granddaughter. She had her young. Yeah. I paid four forty-five, sixty-four on my Camry, which got totaled by neighbor, and I paid fourteen hundred dollars a month rent, and I still survive. But now I get a thousand seventy-eight. I can't pay rent like that anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's tough. And yeah. The subsidized housing, and they're full. So since sub- subsidized housing is full, would you consider moving to a cheaper area, or do you even have the means to do that? I can't really move right now, but I mean, I lived in San Pedro for a while, and it was significantly cheaper. Mm-hmm. Car right now. Somebody gave me a car in the yard, so I don't have to mm-hmm. get around as much. It's a lot for me to get on the bus with my late date, but right now I'm having a hard time. To be on the yeah. Bus here. So, I like Pedro. I'd, I'd be open to it. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like there's like a combination of problems. So, even and though, speaking with MJ that, and Roger, the yeah. Rent, the, the lowest rent they go on studio soda is $900. I get $1,000 for $100 for food. My yeah. companion and my wife shits in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what else? I mean, you know, I like my nails done. That's my only gift to myself. And uh-huh. Things like that. Designer purses, my acrylic nails, and my nice jeans. You're used to your... Yeah, now I have to put all that. Your designer. Yeah. So it sounds like talking to the three of you guys, number one, if you have a disability, you're not getting enough money to live. 
Um, you know, you can't afford rent, so you end up being homeless. And then once you're homeless, there aren't enough services. Per month? Oh, that's great. That would be enough for you to live on top of that, <laughs> on top of the rent. Yeah. Yeah. I like that they assume that everybody that's homeless is a drug addict or mental health issues. I didn't get diagnosed with depressive bipolar until two years after I got attacked. All right, Miha. My whole life I had depression and anxiety, but they said no. You know what I mean? But you were able to work for 26 years. Yeah. So, so what I'm getting from a lot of people here is that. Um, you know, there's a big argument about where to put the shelters and we don't want to shelter in our city or our city. Um, but the thing that I'm hearing from a lot of people who are homeless or have been homeless is that they don't want shelters to begin with. They're only a temporary situation and we need um, rehab for people who have issues and we also need subsidized housing for people who, you know, don't need rehabilitation but can't work. Now we've got Joy, who is formerly homeless and she is now an advocate and she works really hard. She does a great job. <laughs> Thank you. I had um, been in a state hospital in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, they released me with a bus ticket, my shoestrings, nowhere to go, no support. When you were five? When I was 17. Oh, when you were 17. Yeah. Okay. But I was in there from five to 17. Mm -hmm. I had nowhere to go, and I ended up on Third Street here in Santa Ana. While I was homeless, um, I, I ended up losing everything. You voluntarily gave up your up. kids for their best interests. Yeah. I, I didn't feel that I had any issues, mm -hmm. even though I knew that I had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, major depression. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't want to show it, and I didn't want to be labeled. So you didn't start using drugs until you became homeless due to your mental health issues. Exactly. And what is the reason that you started using drugs? Because I was able to deal with people. Mm -hmm. I was able to hold conversations in big crowds. Mm -hmm. You were staying with 400 people in the armory and because of your paranoid schizophrenia, that's why you started us using the drugs because you were able to survive in that environment. You needed some sort of... Exactly. They steal our cell phones. Mm -hmm. They steal our... You know, if, if we got a bus pass, they would find a way to get that bus pass from us. You started using drugs too to stay awake so you could... because So your stuff wouldn't get... How, what did you do to, to overcome being homeless and your mental illness and addictions was support you know yeah. the county gave me a program and gave me a case manager our housing coordinator she said you can have anything you want you can recover even if you have a mental health issue mm -hmm. you know whether you take medications or not you can recover mm -hmm. you can succeed and you can be somebody because you are somebody. When I first got my housing, I used to take people from the Civic Center and sneak them into my apartment. And they'd sleep in my apartment and I'd sleep in my car. <laughs> well, my worker decided to come after hours at five o'clock and they did surprise visits. Oh no. And he goes, did you know you can lose your place if you're not in it and all these people are? Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people were evicted, mm -hmm. because they didn't have that support, mm -hmm. they didn't have that service to call somebody to do a surprise visit. They always mm -hmm. said, oh, well, we're going to come and check on you at this day, mm -hmm. or, you know, hey, I can't make it this week, so mm -hmm. we're just going to talk on the phone. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. That's not supportive housing. Okay, so Joy, what speaking with you, what you're saying is that shelters aren't, you know, a long-term solution. They're good to be used as a triage center to determine what programs, you know, someone should go to, but really nobody wants to stay in a shelter. People would actually rather live in an encampment, and actually I was talking to Millie and she yeah. said she felt safer in her tent with her dog than she does at, at shelters. The, and the, so, reason, the reason that they made these encampments is because 
all these shelters, they're not having the support that they need to grow. That concludes our interviews. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. If you or someone you know is homeless or in need, please check out the resources listed in this video's description. Have a great day.